Do you feel a shiver up your spine from fear? Yes, it's another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind. Amp up your imagination and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Horsehair Trunk by Dave Grubb To Marius the fever was like a cloud of warm river fog around him, or like the blissful vacuum that he had always imagined death would be. He had lain for nearly a week like this in the big corner room while the typhoid raged and boiled inside him. Marianne was a dutiful wife. She came and fed him his medicine and stood at the foot of the brass bed when the doctor was there, clasping and unclasping her thin hands. And sometimes, from between hot heavy lids, Marius could glimpse her face, dimly pale and working slowly in prayer. Such a fool she was, a praying stupid fool that he had married five years ago. He could remember thinking that even in the deep troubled delirium of the fever. "'You want me to die,' he said to her one morning when she came with his medicine. "'You want me to die, don't you?' "'Marius, don't say such a thing. Don't ever. It's true, though,' he went on hearing his voice miles above him at the edge of the quilt. You want me to die, but I'm not going to. I'm going to get well, Marianne. I'm not going to die. Aren't you disappointed? No, no, it's not true. It's not. Now, though he could not see her face through the hot blur of fever, he could hear her crying, sobbing and shaking with her fist pressed tight against her teeth. Such a fool. On the eighth morning Marius woke full of a strange fiery brilliance, as if all his flesh were glass, not yet cool from the furnace. He knew the fever was worse, close to its crisis, and yet it no longer had the quality of darkness and mists. Everything was sharp and clear. The red of his necktie, hanging in the corner of the bureau mirror, was aflame, and he could hear the minutest stirrings down in the kitchen the breaking of a matchstick in Marianne's fingers as clear as pistol shots outside his bedroom window. It was a joy. Marius wondered for a moment if he might have died, but if it was death it was certainly more pleasant than he had ever imagined death would be. He could rise from the bed without any sense of weakness, and he could stretch his arms, and he could even walk out through the solid door into the upstairs hall. He thought it might be fun to tiptoe downstairs and give Marianne a fright, but when he was in the parlor he remembered suddenly that she would be unable to see him. Then, when he heard her coming from the kitchen with his medicine, he thought of an even better joke. With a speed of thought, Marius went back in his body under the quilt again, and Marianne was coming into the bedroom with her large eyes wide and worried. Marius, she whispered, leaning over him and stroking his hot forehead with her cold thin fingers. Marius, are you better? He opened his eyes as if he had been asleep. I see, he said, that you have moved the pianola over to the north end of the parlor. Marianne's eyes widened and the glass of amber liquid rattled against the dish. Marius, she whispered, you haven't been out of bed. You'll kill yourself with a fever like... No, said Marius faintly, listening to his own voice as if it were in another room. I haven't been out of bed, Marianne. His eyelids flickered weakly up at her face, round and ghost-like, incredulous. She quickly set the tinkling glass of medicine on the little table. Then how? She said, Marius, how could you know? Marius smiled weakly up at her and closed his eyes, saying nothing, leaving the terrible question unanswered, leaving her to tremble and ponder over it forever, if need be. She was such a fool. It had begun that way, and had been so easy, he wondered, why he had never discovered it before. Within a few hours the fever broke in great rivers of sweat, and by Wednesday Marius was able to sit up in the chair by the window and watch the starlings hopping on the front lawn. By the end of the month he was back at work as editor of the Daily Argus. But even those who knew him least were able to detect in the manner of Marius Lindsay that he was a changed man, and a worse one. And those who knew him best wondered how so malignant a citizen such a confirmed and studied misanthrope as Marius could possibly change into anything worse than he was. 
Some said that typhoid always burned the temper from the toughest steel, and that Mary's mind had been left a dark and twisted thing. At prayer meeting on Wednesday nights, the wives used to watch Mary's young wife and wonder how she endured her cross. She was such a pretty thing. One afternoon in September, as he dozed on the bulging leather couch of his office, Marius decided to try it again. The secret he knew lay somewhere on the brink of sleep. If a man knew that, any man, he would know what Marius did. It wasn't more than a minute later that Marius knew that all he would have to do to leave his body was to get up from the couch. Presently he was standing there staring down at his heavy, middle-aged figure sunk deep into the cracked leather of the couch. The jowls of his face under the close-cropped mustache sagging deep in sleep, the heart above his heavy gold watch chain beating solidly in its breast. I'm not dead, he thought, delighted. But here is my soul, my damned immortal soul, standing looking at its body. It was as simple as shedding a shoe. Marius smiled to himself, remembering his old partner, Charlie Cunningham, and how they used to spend long hours in the office, in his very room, arguing about death and atheism and the wither of the soul. If Charlie were still alive, Marius thought, I would win him a quarter of the best Kentucky bourbon in the county. As it was, no one would ever know. He would keep his secret even from Marianne, especially from Marianne, who would go to her grave with a superstitious belief that Marius had died for a moment, that for an instant fate had favored her, that she had been so close to happiness to freedom from him forever. She would never know. Still, it would be fun to use as a trick a practical joke to set fools like his wife at their wit's edge. If only he could move things. If only the filmy substance of his soul could grasp a tumbler and send it shattering at Marianne's feet on the kitchen floor some morning, or tweak a copyboy's nose, or snatch a cigar from the teeth of Judge John Robert Grants as he strolled home some quiet evening from the fall session of the district court. Well, it was, after all, a matter of will, Marius decided. It was his own powerful and indomitable will that had made the trick possible in the first place. He walked to the edge of his desk and grasped at the letter opener on the dirty, ancient blotter. His fingers were like wisp of fog that blew through a screen door. He tried again, willing it with all his power, grasping again and again at the small brass dagger, until at last it moved a fraction of an inch. A little more. On the next try it lifted four inches in the air and hung for a second on its point before it dropped. Mary spent the rest of the afternoon practicing until at last he could lift the letter opener in his fist, fingers tight around the haft, the thumb pressing the cold blade tightly, and drive it through the blotter so deeply that it bit into the wood of the desk beneath. Mary giggled in spite of himself and hurried around the office, picking things up like a pleased child. He lifted a tumbler off the dusty water cooler and stared laughing at it, hanging there in the middle of nothing. At that moment he heard the copy boy coming for the proofs of the morning editorials, and Marius flitted quickly back into the cloak of his flesh. Nor was he a moment too soon. Just as he opened his eyes, the door opened, and he heard the glass shatter on the floor. "'I'm going to take a nap before supper, Marianne,' Marius said that evening, hanging his black hat carefully on the Alcorn hat rack. "'Very well,' said Marianne. He watched her young, unhappy figure disappearing into the gloom of the kitchen, and he smiled to himself again, thinking what a fool she was, his wife. He could scarcely wait to get to the Davenport and stretch out in that cool, dark parlor with his head on the beaded pillow. Now, thought Marius, now. And in a moment he had risen from his body and hurried out into the hallway, struggling to suppress the laughter that would tell her he was coming. He could already anticipate her white, stricken face when the pepper pot pulled firmly from between her fingers, cut a clean figure eight in the air before it crashed against the ceiling. He heard her voice and was puzzled. "'You must go,' she was murmuring. "'You mustn't ever come here when he's home. "'I've told you that before, Jim. "'What would you do if he woke up and found you here?' Then Marius, as he rushed into the kitchen, saw her bending through the doorway into the dusk with a saucepan of greens clutched in her white knuckles. "'What would you do?' You must go. Marius rushed to her side, careful not to touch her, careful not to let either of them know he was there, listening, looking, flaming hatred, growing slowly inside him. The man was young and dark and well-built and clean-looking. He leaned against the half-open screen door, holding Marianne's free hand between his own. 
his round, dark face bent to hers, and she smiled with a tenderness and passion that Marius had never seen before. I know, the man said. I know all that. But I just can't stand it no more, Marianne. I just can't stand it thinking about him being you up that last time. He might do it again, Marianne. He might. He's worse, they say, since he had the fever. Crazy, I think. I've heard them say he's crazy. Yes, yes. You must go away now, though, she said, whispering frantically, looking back over her shoulder through Marius's dark face. We'll have time to talk it all over again, Jim. I, I know I'm going to leave him, but don't rush me into things, Jim, dear. Don't make me do it till I'm clear with myself. Why not now, came the whisper. Why not tonight? We can take a steamboat to Louisville, and you'll never have to put up with him again. You'll be shed of him forever, honey. Look, I've got two tickets for Louisville right here in my pocket on the Nance B. Turner. My God, Marianne, don't make me suffer like this. Lying in bed nights dreaming about him coming at you with his cane and beating you, maybe killing you. The woman grew silent, and her face softens as she watched the fireflies dart their zigzags of cold light under the low trees along the street. She opened her mouth, closed it, and stood biting her lips hard. Then she reached up and pulled his face down to her, seeking his mouth. All right, she whispered then. All right, I'll do it. Now go, quick. Meet me at the wharf at nine, he said. Tell him that you're going to a prayer meeting. He'll never be suspicious of anything. Then we can be together without all this sneaking around. Oh, honey, if you ever knew how much I... The words were smeared in her kiss as he pulled her down through the half-open door and held her. All right, all right, she gasped. Now go, please. And he walked away, his heels ringing boldly on the bricks, lighting a cigarette, the match arching like a shooting star into the darkness of the shrubs. Marianne stood stiff for a moment in the shadows of the porch vines, her large eyes full of tears and the saucepan of greens grown cold in her hands. Marius drew back to let her pass. He stood then and watched her for a moment before he hurried back into the parlor and lay down again within his flesh and bone in time to be called for supper. Captain Joe Alexander of the Nancy B. Turner was not curious that Marius should want a ticket for Louisville. He remembered years later that he had thought nothing strange about it at the time. It was less than two months till the elections, and there was a big Democratic convention there. Everyone had heard of Marius Lindsay and the power he and his daily Argus held over the choices of the people. But Captain Alexander did remember thinking it strange that Marius should insist on seeing the passenger list of the Nancy B. that night, and that he should ask particularly after a man named Jim. Smith, Marius had said, but there was no Smith. There was a Jim, though, a furniture salesman from Wheeling, Jim O'Toole, who had reserved two staterooms, number three and number four. What do you think of the presidential chances this term, Mr. Lindsay? Captain Alexander had said, and Marius had looked absent for a moment. The captain had never failed to recount that detail, and then said that it would be Cleveland, that the Republicans were done forever. Captain Alexander had remembered that conversation and the manner of its delivery years later and had become part of the tale that rivermen told in wharf boats and water street saloons from Pittsburgh to Cairo long after that night had woven itself into legend. Then Marius had asked for stateroom number five, and that had been part of the legend too, for it was next to the room that would be occupied by Jim O'Toole, the furniture salesman from Wheeling. Say nothing, said Marius, before he disappeared down the stairway from the captain's cabin to anyone about my being aboard this boat tonight. My trip to Louisville is connected with the approaching election and is of necessity confidential. Certainly, sir, said the captain, and he listened as Marius made his way awkwardly down the gilded staircase, lugging his small horsehair trunk under his arm. Presently the door to Marius' stateroom snapped shut and the bolt fell to. At nine o'clock sharp, two rockaway buggies rattled down the brick pavement of Water Street and met at the wharf. A man jumped from one and a woman from the other. You say he wasn't home when you left, the man was whispering as he helped the woman down the rocky cobbles, the two carpet bags tucked under his arm. No, but it's all right, Mary Ann said. He always goes down to the office this time of night to help set up the morning edition. You reckon his suspicions have anything to do with it? The woman laughed a low, sad laugh. He's always suspicious of everybody, she said. Marius is the kind of a mind that always is suspicious. And the kind of life he leads, I guess he has to. 
but I don't think he knows about us tonight. I don't think he ever knew about us, ever. They hurried up the gangplank together. The water lapped and gurgled against the wharf, and off over the river lightning scratched the dark rim of mountains like the sudden flare of a kitchen match. I'm Jim O'Toole, Jim said to Captain Alexander, handing him the ticket. This is my wife. Marianne bit her lip and clutched the strap of her carpet bag till her knuckles showed through the flesh. She has a stateroom next to mine. Is everything in order? Right, sir, said Captain Alexander, wondering in what strange way the destinies of this furniture salesman and his wife were meshed with the life of Marius Lindsay. They tiptoed down the worn carpet of the narrow white hallway, counting the numbers on the long, monotonous row of doors to either side. Good night, dear, said Jim, glancing unhappily at the porter, dozing on the split-bottom chair under the swinging oil lamp by the door. Good night, Marianne. Tomorrow we'll be on our way. Tomorrow you'll be shed of Marius forever. Marius lay in his bunk, listening, as a deep-throated whistle took the quiet valley three times. Then he lay smiling and relaxed, as the great drive shafts tensed and plunged, once forward and backward, gathering into their dark, heavy rhythm as the paddles bit the black water. The Nancy B. Turner moved heavily away into the thick current and headed downstream for the Devil's Elbow and the open river. Marius was stiff. He had lain for nearly four hours waiting to hear the voices. Every sound had been as clear to him as the tick of his heavy watch in his vest pocket. He had heard the dry, raspy rabbit of the green frogs along the shore and the low, occasional words of boys fishing in their skiffs down the shore under the willows. Then he had stiffened as he heard Marianne's excited murmur, suddenly just outside his stateroom door, and the voice of the man answering her, comforting her. Lightning flashed and flickered out again over the Ohio hills, and lit the river for one clear moment. Marius saw all of his stateroom etched suddenly in silver from the open porthole, the mirror, washdown, bowl, and pitcher, the horsehair trunk beside him on the floor. Thunder rumbled in the dark, and Marius smiled to himself, secure again in the secret darkness, thinking how easy it would be, wondering why no one had thought of such a thing before, except for the heavy pounding rhythm of the drive shafts and the chatter of the drinking glass against the washbowl as the boat shuddered through the water. Everything was still. The porter dozed in his chair under the lantern by the stateroom door. Once Marius thought he heard the lover's voice in the next room, but he knew then that it was the laughter of the cooks down in the galley. Softly he rose and slipped past the sleeping porter, making his way for the white-painted handrail at the head of the stairway. Once Marius laughed aloud to himself as he realized that there was no need to tiptoe with no earthly substance there to make a sound. He crept down the narrow stairway to the galley. The cooks bent round the long wooden table eating their supper. Marius slid his long shadow along the wall toward the row of kitchen knives, lying freshly washed and honed on the zinc table by the pump. For a moment he hovered over them, dallying with his finger in his mouth, like a child before an assortment of equally tempting sweets, before he chose the longest of them all, and the sharpest a knife that would shear the ham clean from a hog with one quick upward sweep. There was, he suddenly realized, the problem of getting the knife past human eyes, even if he himself was invisible. The cooks laughed, then at some joke one of them had made, and all of them bent forward their heads in a dark circle of merriment over their plates. In that instant, Marius swept the knife soundlessly from the zinc table and darted into the gloomy companionway. The porter was asleep still, and Marius laughed himself to imagine the man's horror at seeing the butcher's knife, its razor edge flashing bright in the dull light, inching itself along the wall. But it was a joke he could not afford. He bent at last and slipped the knife cautiously along the threadbare rug under the little ventilation space beneath the stateroom door, and then, rising so full of hate that he was half afraid he might shine forth in the darkness, Marius passed through the door and picked the knife up quickly again in his hand. Off down the Ohio the thunder throbbed again. Marius stepped carefully across the worn rug toward the sleeping body in the trunk. He felt so gay and light he almost laughed aloud. In a moment it would be over and there would be one full-throated cry and Marianne would come beating on the locked door and when she saw her lover. With an impatient gesture Marius lifted the knife and felt quickly for the sleeping, pulsing throat. The flesh was warm and living under his fingers as he held it taut for the one quick stroke. His arm flashed. 
it was done. Marius, fainting with excitement, leaned in the darkness to brace himself. His hand came to rest on the harsh, rough surface of the horsehair trunk. "'My God!' screamed Marius. "'My God!' And at his cry, the laughing murmur in the galley grew still, and there was a sharp scrape of a chair outside the stateroom door. "'The wrong room!' screamed Marius. "'The wrong room!' And he clawed with fingers of smoke at the jetting fountain of his own blood. Lucia's Kiss by Roderick McLeish They came in from the hills and the outlying farms. Some came from so great a distance that they arose before dawn and returned to their homes long after the sun had set. But still they came to Ballow on Sunday for church. Church was the end purpose of everything. It was the citadel of worship, the social center, indeed. It was the very reason that they had migrated to this wild and unplowed land. And they liked Pastor Shapin. He was a simple man, stern and devout, earnestly seeking to understand their sufferings and guide them to their salvation. The preacher lived alone in his house, observing with strict piety the laws of his sect. All of his energies and zeal had been directed to one end, the defeat of Satan in the colonies. To Pastor Shapin, the war against the Lord of Evil was his war, personally bestowed on him. In some earlier year, he had suddenly had a presentiment of the devil, and because of it, he had cast aside everything in his grim dedication. He was unmarried, and sought neither love nor friendship. He lived only to banish old Scratch from the colonies forever. Thus it was surprising to his parishioners when, on a sunny May morning in the year 1692, they came in to worship at Ballow and saw a young and very beautiful girl standing by the parson's side as he left the church. Surely he had not married. No, the question was quickly answered. As each member of the congregation passed by, the girl was introduced as Lucia, daughter of Parson Chaffin's late brother from Northtown. How nice to have you among us, smiled Mrs. Warren, and so nice for the parson. A man ought to have a woman in his house, laughed the huge burly miller as he shook the girl's hand for each lucia had a shy becoming smile and a simple answer and when they had all passed by she turned to her uncle you see he said gravely they do like you my dear lucia's dark eyes turned downward and her fair skin reddened i didn't come to have them like me she murmured i only want to make you happy and to help you the parson smiled tenderly you are a good child, he said. Come, we'll go to dinner. He locked the church door, and taking the girl's arm, walked homeward. Never, thought the Reverend Mr. Chafin, had the world seemed so bright. The little town was through its winter. The buttercups and purple cornflowers were blooming. Not far away the river ran clear and sparkling. And now this lovely child had come to make his house gay with her laughter and beauty. With all of this, thought the parson, no evil could ever permeate his parish. As the weeks passed by, Lucia's beauty did not go unnoticed. Young men came calling at the parson's house to walk out with the girl, but they found little opportunity, for she was busy morning and night, scrubbing, cooking, helping old Mother Avon, the parson's housekeeper, and even assisting the minister in visiting the poor of the parish. And sadly, after a passionate declaration of undying devotion, each suitor turned away. Lucia had no time for them, her only interest was her uncle but one was more persistent. Sam Bower had never learned to take no for an answer. Each day he could be found in the minister's house, following Lucy about, joking with Mother Avon and even helping the parson, became accepted in the parish house that the young man would cut hay, reshoe the team, and help with the manual chores. And as the spring turned into summer and the summer to brown warm autumn, a struggle grew within Lucia. Her growing affection for Sam was obvious, but she seemed determined to remain unmarried to serve her uncle until the end of his days. One night, when the minister had retired early, Lucia came into the room where Mother Avon sat sewing by the candlelight. The old woman looked up and smiled. "'Good evening, my duck. And how are you out walking with your young man on this fine night?' Lucia sat on the long bench beside the fire and shook her head. "'I told him to go away,' she said softly. "'Now, what a silly thing to do!' cried Mother Avon. He's a fine one, and the prize of every girl in town. It's too late now, said Lucia, a catch in her gentle voice. I'll probably never see him again. 
Now, 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 the old woman soothed. You just make up to him and tell him you're sorry, and he'll come back. But how can I tell him, sobbed the girl. He'll never come back. You might send him a note, suggested Mother Avon, resuming her sewing. Have you no place where you could leave it? Lucia nodded her head. In a tree on Cammer's Hill. Then you just write him one, said Mother Avon, and take it there. And he'll come for it, sure, if I know my lads. But I can't, wept Lucia. I can't go there alone at night. She dried her eyes and looked appealingly at the old woman. Would you? Mother Avon laughed. It'll be a poor man who'd bother the likes of me this night. Write it, child, and I'll take it. So the note was written and handed to the old woman. And where did you say the place was, she asked. On Cammer's Hill, in the trunk of the dead tree. Mother Avon frowned. "'Tis a strange place. They say the witches meet there. Lucia smiled. "'No witch would bother you,' she said gently. "'They come only for the wicked.' Sam Bower stood alone in the tavern, staring moodily at his tankard of ale. All around him the farmers and workmen were laughing and talking, but there was no joy in the big Sam's heart. He was thinking of Lucia, her strange reddance, and the quarrel that had finally departed them. In his simple, logical mind there was no reason for Lucia to turn him out. He saw that she obviously loved him, but the very fact seemed to frighten her. Suddenly the door of the tavern burst open and a girl's scream broke the soft babble of voices. Sam turned quickly to see Mary Turner, wife of Elias Turner, standing in the doorway. Her hair was loose and tangled, her dress torn, and her eyes wide with fear. She stood paralyzed for a moment, staring wild-eyed into the room, her breath coming in choking sobs. Elias, she gasped. Elias, she tottered forward to fall into her husband's arm. Swiftly the man gathered about her. A glass of brandy was brought, and presently the terrified girl opened her eyes and looked into their faces. Elias, she said, her voice slow in terror. I saw it. You saw what? Himself. I saw. She choked and turned her face into her husband's arm, sobbing hysterically. Gradually she was soothed, and when she turned back to speak again, her eyes were wide. I was walking to Mother Gammon's. She's been ill. I want to take her broth. Suddenly, just this side of her gate, suddenly I saw a huge hound, a beast, Elias. His eyes were red, flaming, and his mouth dripped molten fire. He came for me, Elias. The men gasped. Elias Turner shook his wife roughly. And then, Mary, I ran. I screamed. But he was faster than I, she sobbed, and suddenly I fell. The dog leaped at me, roaring and growling. I threw up my hands as he came from my throat, and then, yes, he spoke. There was a stunned silence. Good God, protect us, muttered one. A very devil, said another. The devil himself, sobbed Mary. What did he say? Mary Turner choked as she answered. On Cammer's Hill, the witches fly, the first to go, the last to die. And then, sobbing with terror, she threw her arms around her husband's neck and would speak no more. Slowly, the men drew away from her. Fear was in their eyes. They had dreaded this moment. For years they had heard the warnings. Voiced through the land by the stern preachers, roared in the wilderness by Cotton Mather, told again and again from their own pulpit by Parson Chafin. They had heard that Lucifer would come to seize the colonies, that no man could escape the shadow of the Lord of Evil, and one day he would walk from the forest to claim their souls. They had shuddered at the solemnity of the sermon, and now the autumn night seemed chill as they thought of the warning that had come to them. "'We'd better get the preacher,' said one. "'No, wait,' said another. "'Think what it means. "'On Cammer's Hill the witches fly, "'the first to go, the last to die. "'There's a witch on the hill. "'He who gets her first will be spared the longest. "'Aye, let's get her.' "'And like wind on the wheat, the fear is spread among them. "'In a matter of moments they were spilling out into the night, "'armed with pitchforks and clubs. "'A few protested, but were quickly shouted down. "'Torches were brought, and suddenly the town was alive "'with the flickering lights and the shouts of the mob. "'Swiftly they ran the length of the town "'and out into the open fields. "'Sleeping birds rose in the trees as they passed, "'and dogs followed in their wake, "'howling with excitement. "'The foot of Camer's Hill was quickly reached, "'and in an instant the slope was alive "'with a frenzied mob. "'They spread in all directions and swarmed up the hillside, "'and then suddenly there was a loud shout. Crouched among the gnarled roots of a dead tree, her eyes bright with terror, huddled Mother Avon. Again and again the judge pounded his gavel, and presently the courtroom became quiet. 
Never before had so many people crowded into the small space. Men, women, children had come from miles around as the story spread through the colony. They were gathered half in holiday spirit, half in fear, to view the witch. The terrible meaning of the trial seemed distant in the bright sunlight, and the heinous of the accusation did not fit the old woman who sat slumped before the bench. Oye, oye, stroned the provost, the people of the commonwealth versus Marion de Bon Avon, accused of witchcraft and conspiracy with the forces of evil. First the prosecutor spoke, telling the grim story over again. Next, Mary Turner, frightened and refusing to look at Mother Avon, took the stand. In a hushed voice, she told of her wild visitation. At last, Mother Avon herself spoke. Her voice quavered as she related how she had carried the note for Lucia, and how when turning away from the tree she had seen the mob coming for her. Then the court called Lucia. "'Your name is Lucia Chapin?' "'Yes, my lord.' "'And you have heard the testimony of the accused?' "'Yes, my lord.' "'What say you to her charge that you sent her to the hill with a note for this young man?' Lucia blushed. "'She is a good woman, my lord, and I am sure.' The prosecutor smiled gently. "'We are not asking that you defend her, my child. Just speak the truth. Did you send her to the hill?' Lucia's head bowed. She clasped her hand in desperation. When she looked up, there were tears in her eyes. "'No, my lord. I retired very early upon that night. I did not see her after the evening meal was done.' Her voice was low and sorrowing. "'That will be all,' the prosecutor turned away. "'But, my lord,' Lucia rose in the stand and looked appealingly at the bench. The prosecutor turned, eyeing her quizzically. "'She has done much good,' pleaded the girl earnestly. "'I beg you reconsider. She is not guilty of evil.' The prosecutor smiled. "'Evil,' he said softly, "'comes in strange forms.' Suddenly Mother Avon was on her feet. "'The girl lies,' she screamed. "'Twas she that sent me!' The old woman broke away from those who restrained her and ran to where Lucia stood. She fell on her knees and threw her arms around the girl. Like, Tell them, child. Don't let them hang me. In an instant, Lucia was on the floor beside her, her arms around the thin old body. Spare her, she sobbed. Oh, spare her. Swiftly the trial moved on as the damning evidence built higher and higher round the old woman, and at last, when Parson Shapin spoke, there was no power left to save her. Triumphantly the old man arose. For years he had fought an invisible enemy, one that dared not show himself before the preacher's might. Now Satan had come into the open for a last desperate stand. The parson began his speech in a low, quiet voice. He spoke of the prophecies of Isaiah, of the simple wisdom of the Proverbs, and the teachings of Paul. Then his voice grew louder as he turned to recounting the fall of Lucifer, and at last his mighty words thundered against the very rafters, filling the courtroom with their exhortation as he demanded the death of the woman, who had cast her lot with Satan. When he had finished, the room was silent. Then the verdict came, and the witch was condemned to die. Lucia sat quietly in her uncle's living room. The firelight played on her beautiful eyes and danced in the soft rolls of her hair. The white skin of her cheeks was wet with tears, and she stared straight before her, seeing and hearing nothing. At last her uncle rose from his chair and put his arm around the grief-stricken girl. "'Do not weep, my child,' he said gently. "'She died in knowledge of her God.' Lucia leaned against him wearily. There were few tears, no more grief would come from her. Did she suffer, she asked. Through their suffering the wicked shall find salvation, replied her uncle. Do not grieve for her. There will be more, many more. I, I feel that I might have saved her, said Lucia softly. You would not want to save a witch, Parson Chafin said. You did her service by telling the truth, for now perhaps she is with God and has forgiveness for her sins. Lucia slipped her hands over his arms. You were wonderful in court. I could not help but be proud. Parson Chafin smiled, and I was proud of you. Lucia leaned against him. I'm glad we're alone at last. There have been so many people, so much to do. I shall have to get a new housekeeper. No, she looked up at him and smiled through her tears. I am mistress of this house now, and want no other woman to help me. He began to say something, but stopped. He began to remember that she was a woman, and then another instant she was his niece, the daughter of his brother. Gently he kissed her and arose. I shall go to bed now. She stood with him. Good night. She put her hands on his arms and drew him to her and kissed his cheek. When there are others to fight, I will be here, always here. The old man held her for a moment and then went hastily from the room. Again Lucia sat by the fire, staring into the darkness and seeing nothing. Suddenly there was a knock on the door. It startled Lucia out of her reverie and she rose to admit Sam Bower. Well, Sam, she said, this is late to come calling. I had to see you, he told her. I saw you in the court. Lucia sat on the bench again. 
It was terrible, she said softly, the poor woman. But she was a witch, cried Sam. She deserved to be hanged. Do you believe that all evils should be banished? Lucia suddenly asked him. For a moment her lovely face was hard, and her eyes narrow as she waited for his answer. Of course, Sam said, of course. Lucia said nothing but turned to look into the fire. Gently, Sam knelt beside her. Lucia, he said, don't send me away again. He talked to her for a long time. He told her again that he loved her. He told her about the farmland he would buy, the farm and the house he would build for her, and the children they might have. Suddenly she stood up. The tears were fresh on her cheeks again. Stop! She cried desperately. It can never be. I can't marry you. And why not? demanded Sam angrily. I'm as good as any man in Ballow. It isn't that. I didn't come to fall in love. I came to... Abruptly she stopped speaking and turned away from him. What did you come for, Lucia? asked Sam tersely. Good night, Lucia said. She did not turn back, but walked quickly from the room, closing the door behind her. The fall came, and then a cold winter followed that year, and the prediction of further mischief came true. As the winds howled through the Ballows' deserted streets, the manifestations of witchcraft were everywhere. A tree burst into flame in Piety Chester's farmyard, and Piety died by law before the week was out. In a nearby village, three little girls were suddenly seized with fits, and their mother was put to death. All through the colony, the disciples of Satan seemed suddenly busy. And always Parson Chafin was there. He had become exultant in his battle, restlessly probing every story and outburst, ruthlessly pushing the prosecution of the offenders. Some died screaming their innocence, others fought grimly for life until the rope snuffed out the last spark. From his pulpit the parson thundered out names and accusations, exhorting his congregation and proclaiming that the devil was abroad in the land. Lucia stayed close by her uncle's house that winter. She worked as before scrubbing floors, washing and cooking, seemingly content with no company but his. From time to time Sam came to see her, but she always sent him away. At times, after his visits, Lucia would go into the woods alone, crying bitterly, torn by fears. Parson Chafin struggled in his own battle against Satan that winter. Suddenly Lucia had seemed more lovely than ever before. Her slim, shy girlhood had grown into the haunting beauty of a mature woman. Each night she waited for him, and by the candlelight of their dinner, her gentle face and strong body seemed overpoweringly desirable, and the preacher fought grimly to be blind to her. Time and time again she protested that she loved no one, not even Sam Bower. Her only love, she said softly, was for her uncle, and in the sleepless nights Parson Chafin puzzled over what form her love took and hated himself for wondering. At night, he would hear her moving about the house, long after the entire town was asleep. Occasionally, he thought he heard voices, Lucia's and others, but always his mind and senses were drugged with weariness, and he dismissed the sounds as dreams. He would not rise to investigate her reason for being awake and about, for he did not trust himself to go to her when the world was dark and still. And in the town they said that she was dutiful and good. The spring came late that year and brought no joy. In the hearts of the people there was a mixture of dread and weariness. The fear of the evil works was still upon them, but they were tired of the man-made terror of the rope. Old friends and loved ones had died, and the people turned to Parson Chafin to question how long it would go on. But still the preacher thundered from his pulpit and stalked the streets and countryside in search for his elusive enemy. Always it seemed that Parson Chafin was winning, for even the behavior of the town improved. An old woman who had been a prime liar and gossip suddenly surprised everyone by admitting that she had caused thirteen unhappy homes and had driven her husband to drink, while the husband took the pledge of abstinence and became a deacon in the church. All of this time Sam Bower worked on his new land with confidence that Lucia would change her mind. He cut down trees, cleared away fields, and when May brought the yellow and purple flowers to the hills, the foundations of a log cabin were rising on his acres. Then at last, one rainy night, the fires that tormented Peter Chafin burst from within him, and he rose from his sleepless bed to go to Lucia, who moved about the dark, silent house. For a moment he paused outside the living room door, his heart pounding wildly, then he silently pushed it open. His heartbeat seemed to stand still, and the breath caught in his throat. The small room was dark, illuminated only by the flickering light of the fire. Lucia sat before the hearth, her back to the door. She was no longer the quiet, dutiful niece. 
Her long hair was loose, tumbling over her shoulders, gleaming ebony black in the firelight. She wore a low nightgown, and her feet were bare. In her hand she held a small wooden statuette and a knife. Slowly the glittering point of the instrument bit into the little figure. For a moment the girl did not sense the parts in the room, but when she turned her eyes seemed to gleam with an inner fire, and a slow smile played about her lips. Lucia, gasped the preacher. Yes. Her brows arched as she fixed him with her beautiful eyes. You did send Mother Avon to the mountains, he whispered. And it was you who burned a tree in Pie Chester's farmyard and spoke in the throats of children, she answered. Who are you? muttered Parson Chafin, backing against the door. Slowly Lucia rose and smoothed her nightgown with one hand. She was framed against the firelight, beautiful and evil. Her face was in the shadows, and only her eyes glowed brightly. A thousand women, she said softly, over ten thousand years, when the victims of the Borges died. It was I who poured the poison, and when Judas was tempted, it was I who held the silver. Sister of Satan, Lucia, whispered the parson, his forehead bright with perspiration. A name like his, Lucifer, Lucia, born of my brother, and come to, to defeat you, she smiled, to manifest magic so that many would die and thus destroy you by their deaths, to make you loathe through all time as the witch-killer of Balo. But I have found you out, he cried triumphantly, and I will destroy you to atone for what I have done. He lunged toward her, reaching for her slim body. Not yet, Matthew Chafin, she purred. Swiftly she grasped him and ripped his shirt front open. Then, with a darting movement, she placed her mouth on his chest. Parson Chafin cried out in pain as her lips burned into his skin. He struggled to push her from him, and she fell back against the table, breathing heavily. Here, she said, shoving the wooden statuette and knife into his hands. Then she ran screaming from the house, into the rain. She stood barefoot in the little street, shrieking hysterically. Candles were brought, and soon a half-dozen men were by her side, calming and soothing the sobbing girl. The rain poured over her, wetting her hair and mingling with his tears on her face. He, he attacked me, she moaned. He struck me and tried to kill me. Sam Bower placed his arm round her. He spoke to her softly, his words coming with calm assurance. What happened, Lucille, beloved? What happened? I came into the parlor, she sobbed. He was by the fire. He was putting a knife into an image. Then I saw the mark on his chest, and he struck me. He tried to kill me. The men were silent. They stared in horror at the girl, hardly believing what she told them. Then one of them spoke. "'Twas he who hanged them,' he muttered. "'Twas the devil's trick. I, he hung my Meg. And twas he who made the tree burn and the children speak. "'Tis Satan himself. Angrily they rushed past the weeping girl and into the house. Parson Chafin stood numbly beside the table, holding the knife and little statue in his hand. He did not seem to see them there, nor did he protest when the rough hands tore his shirt to expose the smoking scar on his chest. It was burned deeply into his flesh, the sword with which Lucifer had attacked the city of God. Great clouds scudded across the spring sky, and the wind moaned in the newly budding trees. Last year's leaves rustled over the ground, whirling past the heavy stake that stood buried in the earth. By ten in the morning the crowd had gathered silently around the place of execution, and by noon they brought the preacher. He stood quietly as they tied his arms and piled the brush about him. Some had come in pity, others came believing that they were about to see the death of Lucifer himself, and some could only remember what he had done, how he had guided them from his pulpit over the bitter years of the colony's birth. His sorrowing niece was not present. Lucia had been in the court at his trial, and her pleas for mercy for her uncle had moved the crowd deeply. It was with tears in his eyes that the prosecutor had asked her to desist. The parson stood quietly as they finished binding him, and then gently he began to speak. He asked of them forgiveness for the many who had died at his instigation. He asked forgiveness for his other sins, overzealousness, ambition, and pride. And then at last he began to speak of the forces of hell. Sam Bower turned away from the outskirts of the crowd. He was one who came with loyalty in his heart for the minister. With his head bowed, he walked toward the parish house, the voice of Parson Chafin fading in his ears. The door was unlocked, and he went in without knocking. He had entered the living room where Lucia sat writing at a little table before the window. The girl looked up. I did not hear you come in, she whispered. She was dressed in black, and the stern shade of the morning contrasted against her white skin. He is about to die, said Sam gently. Will you not go and bid him farewell? She shook her head. I cannot. 
she said, dropping her eyes. He was the strongest among us, said Sam. He was our faith itself. Please, she said, go now. He moved a step forward. You have no one. Now will you marry me? She shook her head. There were tears in her eyes. I can never marry you, Sam, she said. I cannot fall in love. I dare not. I dare not come for it. That's the second time you've said that, he said, looking at her strangely. Tell me what you mean, and I will go. Again she shook her head. Please, she whispered desperately. Pity me and go immediately. Look at me, Lucia, he demanded. Look at me and think how happy we might be. Please, she implored for the love of, yes, of Lucia. Can you not say God? Go, Sam, now. There were tears in her eyes as she turned, pleading toward him. What are you writing, he demanded. Quickly, her hands lit over the paper before her. A letter, she said, to my brother. You have no brother, Lucia, he answered grimly. Let me see it. He looked down. From beneath her fingers, a thin coil of smoke curled as the edges of the paper turned brown and crinkled inward. Suddenly it burst into flame and was soon a smoldering ash beneath her fingers. Now you go, she said softly and quickly, for your own sake. That's why you fear me, he whispered. You dare not love a mortal. You dare not love at all. I've tried to turn from you, Sam, she said. Now for your own sake, I beg you go. Already I have damaged myself by sparing you. Sam looked out the window at the crowd in the square. You can still save him, he said. Go quickly. Tell them. No, she said, rising. I cannot. I dare not. It was he whom I came to destroy. Swiftly Sam took her by the shoulders. Her flesh was warm beneath his fingers and burned as he dug into it. Look at me, Lucia, he said fiercely. No, please, she turned her head and pressed away from him. Lucia, you love me. Look at me. Her body shook and tears streamed down her face. Sam held her until she turned her head and looked into his eyes. Now I will burn instead, she whispered, but for it I will have a kiss. Her lips burned his cheek as she pressed into him, and her eyes were hot and smoldering. Then she drew away and went swiftly toward the door. Hurry, he cried, going after her. She ran across the square, with Sam following closely behind her. The executioner was bending to touch the porch to Parson Chafin's pyre when Lucia's hand seized his wrist and stayed him. Wait, she cried, I must speak. Mistress, said the prosecutor, coming forward, you cannot save him now. Release him, said Lucia firmly. He is innocent. It was I, her voice dropped, who put the mark upon him. The crowd gasped, but the prosecutor held up his hand. Go, child, he commanded. You cannot save him now. Swiftly, Lucia gathered her skirts about her and stepped over the faggots that were piled about the parson. As the crowd swept back, she touched his bonds one by one, and as she touched them, they burst into flame and dropped from him. When he was loose, she pushed him from the stake. Be free, she cried to him. You have won. She turned to face Sam, who stood in the edge of the crowd. There were tears in her dark eyes, and the wind blew in her hair. I will burn for you, she sobbed. I should curse you, but I cannot. I can only curse my coming. Suddenly, before the astonished eyes of the crowd, the faggots burst into a roaring fire. Higher and higher, the flames leaped about her as if a wind from the bowels of the earth stirred them into an inferno. She stood weeping while the blasting furnace consumed her body. Then, as the long tresses of her hair splintered into flame, she held out her arms toward Sam, and he alone heard her last despairing cry. I love you, she wept. I love you. And all through his life, Sam Bauer carried her lip marks on his face. But it was an honorable mark, and people looking at it would recall how the sister of Lucifer was defeated in the colonies by the love of a mortal man.